Thank you very much once again to HKU Space and Plymouth University for this invitation. Very happy to see so many excited young people here coming to learn more about the cruise industry, which is a, a fascinating, um, fun business to be involved in. Um, I was asked to talk about something a little bit broader. So about half of my time, I'm going to talk about um, this very big um, project in Hong Kong, which has received a lot of press over the years and is something very visible for basically anybody on the north side of Hong Kong Island. You can, you can look out from your apartment or office and see this enormous thing. So how did it come about? Um, what is it? Where is it going? Um, and then after that, we'll talk more about the cruise industry and, and what you can expect from the industry growth in the years coming. So, um, let's see. There we go. So, um, so just to give you a little bit more background, um, urban planning um, is something that is different in every city. You know, Hong Kong, of course, many mountains, a lot of water, um, different from other cities that may be, you know, flat and, and square. Um, but um, wherever you go, um, and urban planning is a little bit different everywhere, uh, one thing is that um, downtown waterfront land is rare and expensive, and a lot of people want to use it for different things, different communities, different, different businesses, different interest groups. Um, the other thing is... Um, that's happening globally is that um, since containerization um, in many older cities around the world, not so much in Hong Kong, but um, a lot of the waterfront space that was required for, um, for moving cargo tens of years ago, um, now that the industry is so much more efficient, um, not as much waterfront space is needed anymore more land is opening up, and a lot of these cities are thinking, hmm, maybe we can use these former uh, cargo terminal facilities to put in um, passenger shipping business, you know, whether it's ferries or, or cruises, but, you know, often they're in the heart of downtown, in the old part of the city, um, and it's a, it's a very good alternative use, and we're seeing a lot of waterfront areas getting revitalized in, in many cities um, as, this, as this occurs. So, um, in Hong Kong, um, the, uh, I, I call this slide from wealth generation to quality of life. And, and this is sort of the first aspect of um, how I think, you know, we have changed in Hong Kong over the last 20 odd years. Um, I have been here the entire time. So, for, for some of you uh, out there in the audience, I, I bet I started learning Chinese even earlier than you did although yours may be better than mine by now. Um, but um, here, in, here in Hong Kong, um, we had this um, amazing opportunity when the airport was moved to Lantau Island, and it seemed incredibly far away at the time, but it did open up this, um, this massive piece of land um, right in the middle of our, of our central harbor, which is a, a very you know, rare opportunity. So just, just as a little bit of a background, um, in Hong Kong, um, unlike many other cities, the government owns all the land except for the Anglican church <laughs> in one location, and they, they're there forever. Um, we have now um, the most expensive real estate in the world by many measures. Um, land leasing is also a major source of revenue for the Hong Kong government. So, so they have an interest. They're not a, a neutral, disinterested party in, in land prices uh, evolving in Hong Kong. Um, the Kai Tak Cruise Terminal, um, in, in the cruise business, all we think about is cruise. But in the, in the urban planning, um, and, and I've had a, an opportunity to interact with um, people from lands department, development bureau, um, they, they look at it from a much bigger view. And part of the view is if we build something that's visible throughout the whole central harbor, 
um, it has to be nice because if, if it is an ugly tin shack, it will literally um, lower land values throughout the territory, both for existing building and for all those big plots of land next to the cruise terminal, which they plan to lease out soon. Um, so, so one of the reasons that we have you know, this, this beautiful Norman Foster designed cruise terminal in the Central Harbor is because it increases the land values greatly. And if, if any of you have seen the advertisements for flats, being sold at parts of, of you know, Kai Tak that are actually the other end of the runway, you know, two kilometers away. All of them have, you know, a cruise ship sort of floating around, you know, in front of your apartment block. And, and so it, 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 it does a lot, you know, outside of, of our, our specific industry. So, um, so again, here's just a visual illustration. Um, at Kai Tak, um, Unlike many cruise terminals around the world, um, it's visible from everywhere, and, and everybody can see us, and we can see everybody. In, in many, many cities, there, there may be a sort of in-town um, terminal that's sort of in the heart of the old town, but invariably the water's very shallow, um, the, um, the berth is not very long, and, and there will be another um, facility that's farther out of town, not very visible, where there is deep water and land was available, and they could they could build a proper berth for it, um, but but at at Kai Tak we we kind of have both. So um, so how did all this come about? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk us through some of the um, outline zoning plans they're called um, of of how the district um, came about. So. Um, as, as some of you may remember, um, housing prices in Hong Kong reached an all-time high in, in 1997. And um, the only thing that we can do in Hong Kong is to add more supply. In, in other countries, they may raise the interest rate. And raising the interest rate cools off demand and everything balances. But, but we're pegged. Our currency is pegged to the US dollar. So we don't have this option. So all we can do is try to create more supply. So the, um, the initial plan went by another speaker. So the initial plan was to do massive reclamation, basically filling in the entire Tokwa Wan typhoon shelter and, and turning this um, into a, a very large area with um, housing of, for 320,000 people. Um, You'll note there was no cruise terminal at this time. The, the main consideration of the government is everybody was jumping up and down. We need more housing. We need more housing. We need more housing. So, um, so you can see um, in, in the original plan, um, there was housing and there was, there was open space. But we'll, we'll, I'll show you later on how this changed over time. Um, what happened, and, and the plans lag reality a little bit, um, but um, this, is, this is a very long quote from Tong Chi Hua, but it's, it's just so good that I, that I put it here um, in, in full. Um, Tong Chi Hua said, people of Hong Kong, um, we hear your troubles. We're going to build 85,000 flats a year. Now, think about what we've seen in the newspapers over the last year, like the, or several years. The government, you know, oh, trying for 18,000. Oh, maybe we can do 20,000 flats next year if we're lucky, maybe 22. So, so Tung Chi Hua said, we're going to do it, 85,000 flats a year. And the amazing thing was that we all believed him. <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, now it's, it's, you know, we would say, well, you know, where are you going to find the land for this? But... Um, so, so that was the plan. Um, however, the other thing that happened um, was there was a protection of the harbor ordinance. And, and um, we decided, you know, the harbor is now only half as wide as when the British sailed in in 1841. You know, maybe, you know, the, the, the cross-harbor swim is getting a little bit too short to be challenging. You know, let's, let's, uh, let's put an end to, um, to this reclamation. So, um, so what happened, sure enough, uh, property prices crashed 
And um, a lot of people were left with negative equity, meaning that they owed the banks more and, and often much, much more than um, the value of, of the home that they were, were sitting on. And, um, and that led to kind of a, a banking crisis as, as well, because there was a fear that there, there were a couple runs on, on banks um, for fear that they might collapse. Um, this is another quote that's way too long, but what happened subsequently, and, and this I think was sort of common knowledge at the time, but it took, it took about five years for Tung Chi Hua to sort of own up and confess um, in, in public what, what, we, what we knew they had been thinking, which is he said, you know what, uh, before I had a very good idea, um, but now it doesn't seem so good. Um, Deflation has severely dampened people's desire to spend, consume, or investors' desire to invest. Serious damage to government revenue, stifled our growth. Um, it's all because of deflation, because of a 65% drop in property prices. So essentially, um, at this time, 15 years ago, everybody was all pulling their hair out for exactly the opposite reason that we're doing it today. So today, we're all going crazy because the housing prices are way too high, and nobody can afford it, and we can never catch up. And, and, um, and, and 15 years ago, we were, we were tearing our hair out for exactly the opposite reason. You know, I'm, I'm sunk in debt. I'll never get out. Um, so, um, so again, um, as the popular mood change, you know, what, what we need to do, you know, the urban planners went back and, and reacted and said, okay, um, well, A, there's the protection of the harbor ordinance, and, and B, um, nobody wants housing anymore. So, so we're, we're reducing the overall area. So the typhoon shelter came back to an extent, um, a little bit more of, of, the, um, of the Quintong typhoon shelter also. And, um, Amazingly, um, a cruise terminal, a cruise terminal came up. So this is the first appearance of the cruise terminal was in the 2001 plan. Um, so um, it was a finger pier, not not like today, and um, they started to to flesh out plans for how the district would work. Um, there would be Hong Kong's first district cooling system, which did come to pass, and it's operating today, and we're using it. Um, it's um, supposedly 30% more efficient than buildings using their own cooling. But the charges are the same. I, I, that part I haven't figured out yet. But um, then also, um, there's, um, they, they made the plans for the Shatin Central Line, which is under progress. And um, also, uh, oddly in Hong Kong, um, they started to take into consideration um, views, because traditionally in Hong Kong, you know, you might have had waterfront property five years ago, but then, but then somebody builds a building right in front of you, and then, <laughs> and it's it's gone. Sorry. So, so now, um, you know, you see this. They're starting to think about. Okay, we we need to um, maintain views of the mountains. People don't like it when when the buildings cover up the uh, the mountains in the background. So, so this is part of the movement to quality of life. You know, we're not just trying to make as much housing as much as possible so that developers can sell more apartments for more money, but, but also, you know, we want to have our nice views and we want to have space as well. Um, the, the other space, not the HKU space. We want HKU space also. Um, so here's, here's what, the, um, what the 2001 plan looked like in 3D with, again, this, this lovely finger pier at the end of the former runway. So the big difference in, um, in the 2001 plan is that they, um, the, the total area, after taking out the reclamation, was dropped by 40%. Um, residential space dropped by 22%. Um, industrial areas were completely removed. Commercial areas were completely removed. And also, a lot of the government and community space was uh, was taken out. Um, then, um, up into 2006, um, again, housing prices are still low. People want parks and, and green space. And um, just as a comparison, I, I I thought it was interesting. Right now, 
you know, 41% of our of our land in in Hong Kong is is parks. And if you if you another measure is people say how much is developed. Well, actually, 70% is is undeveloped. You know, although it may not be officially zoned as a, as a park, but by international standards, that's a lot. That's that's actually quite a bit. But but um, it's all relative. You know, we the the feeling at the time was. You know, we don't want fancy shopping malls, and we don't want grade A office. We want to have parks, and we want to have green space and places to live. Um, we um, an, another big crisis at the time was um, was SARS, and that that stifled business activity. And you can see how that fed into the property prices at the time. And then um, another another change was that um, originally the protection of the harbor ordinance just said no reclamation unless it's in the public interest and then um, it was brought to court and in in uh, in um, in 2003 then um, there was an interpretation of the law and then they said basically um, we we believe that the legislative intent is that there is no reclamation ever 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 <laughs> and you know unless you know hundreds of people are, are dying because of a failure to extend something one meter it, it will not get it will not get passed and and there's um, we we go back and forth with the government on on this for some um, very sort of minor um, fiddly things but it's 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 in it's in cast in stone now very very no way to change it so after this um, basically um, the plans now show that no reclamation to be done everything to be left the runway still looks like a runway and um, the o the only thing they did at the time is that originally they had two sort of separate planning areas and they said well you know now that the the total space is so much um, smaller, we're, we're just going to bang these two together and make it one big development. So, um, so in, in the next round of development, um, now housing um, has gone down to 86,000 people. So remember, in the beginning, they were talking about over 300,000, um, and then that was reduced to um, just 86,000. So um, the other thing that happened is because no reclamation was allowed is that the pier became an, an alongside pier running up and down the former runway rather than a finger pier sticking out into the harbor, which um, um, pros and cons from, from an operational standpoint, um, I think we would do a lot less walking up and down the pier if it were a finger pier. So that's why Ryan and I are so skinny is because <laughs> we're constantly uh, going, going up and down. Um, the um, another sort of quality of life um, change to the plan at this time was that um, this this typhoon shelter um, when when this when this area was a runway um, it had a lot of runoff there were factories over here and the factories you know basically dumped their their pollution in into this harbor um, and uh, and it smelled terrible. Um, working with one of the um, local shipyards on, on some equipment, um, a, uh, a, a senior staff over there told me, he said, you know, back in the day when we got uh, a, an order to, to scrape barnacles off, off the hull of a ferry, we, we would just drag it over to this typhoon shelter and after a day all the barnacles would die. <laughs> it was much easier to scrape them off after that. So, um, so the decision was, was made, um, right, we're, we're going to clean this up and do a lot of um, remediation work. And um, since we can't fill it in anymore, we're going to take the opposite approach and we're going to open up, um, you know, what had been a river coming from the mountains down into, into that into that typhoon shelter, and and they're um, and they're working on it now. So, um, so this is another sort of quality of life step that we've we've taken, um, and uh, and here's what it should look like. So, um, actually, if you uh, if you go by the area now, you can see they're they're making um, quite quite a bit of progress. So, I think a, a couple of years from now, we'll all have this 
um, new facility to, uh, to enjoy next to Kowloon City. Um, so in this plan, um, again, residential land dropped further. Um, we got some more commercial space back, more government and community. A lot of hospitals were added to the plan. Um, and then I, I think we, we see where this is going. Um, of course, what has happened after this is that, you know, housing prices have started rising up again. Um, we, we also um, recognized kind of late, I think, in Hong Kong that, that we, we used to have a lot of beautiful historical buildings. And um, again, before in this sort of um, naked pursuit of, of wealth, we would, you know, just tear them down and put up something higher because, you know, more saleable floor square, you know, square square meters, and and uh, you can you can make a lot more money that way. But you know, the communities become aware we should really try to preserve these. So, um, so the plans here now mention that um, the uh, Lungjing Bridge, which was the bridge that went to um, the Kowloon Walled City, the one little little chunk of China that stayed China throughout the, the, the British um, colonial era and, um, and, and other archaeological finds um, in the area which um, will be preserved in situ in the uh, Tokowan station. Um, so, so here's the plan uh, after that, a little bit too detailed. But um, at this point, I guess that the main, the main thing about 2012 is now the, um, the land area is, is finalized. It won't get bigger or smaller. Um, the other thing is this is about when we put in our, our bid to run the cruise terminal. So 2011 was when we put in our final, our final bid. So this is, this is what we were planning on. Um, some, other, um, some other changes to the design uh, were there was, there was a very long argument about whether the road should go smack down the middle of the runway, um, with people thinking um, that way, people can walk along the waterfront and enjoy. And then the other camp um, like to have like to have the road kind of on the side, so that there could be a large sort of park area in in the middle on the other side. So so they ended up um, having a, a sort of Davidian um, type type division. So half of the runway. Um, the road runs along top, and the other half of the runway it, roads, it runs along the middle, um, and they're they're building that out now as well too. Um, the um, the other um, topic that that came into focus um, at the beginning of this decade was everybody started talking about uh, Ping Feng Lao. I, I don't know what that is in English, but but just sort of rows of buildings that blocked off the um, the the ventilation. So. Um, so they did a, a study of, of wind flows um, in, the, in the district and as a result modified some building designs. So here's the, um, the children's hospital that's being built now and you can see that they, that they built this, um, this big space in it. So, um, so we, we have to think that the, um, the feng shui expert who, who designed the big hole in the building in, in Repulse Bay, you know, he, he, he maybe uh, knew something that we didn't know, you know, way, way back when, you know, he was building in wind, wind corridors. Um, you know, for all I know, maybe there's a dragon that comes and takes a bath in here in the mornings too, you know. Um, so, um, so more plans, um, you know, ways that we've, that we've kind of developed as a society. Now everybody is quite keen on biking. We should have more biking. You know, I think a hundred years ago, you know, Hong Kong was, was all mountains and biking was probably not a good idea. But now that, now that we've reclaimed so much and it's flat, you know, it's, it's much more bikeable. So, um, so, so there will be a number of bike trails coming in um, and, and hopefully connected on all the, all the way down to TST, we'll see. Um, a, uh, another interesting um, feature in the design is that um, in, this, in this center road going down the former runway, um, they're building, um, and this is quite innovative, or I, I haven't seen it elsewhere, um, what is both a sort of pedestrian walkway um, with um, planters and, and shrubs um, on top of the road, but then it's it's also a, a noise barrier. So it's it's a noise barrier, but it's you know beautiful and and functional and pedestrian friendly also. 
Um, now, of course, everybody knows what's, what's happened to the property price index since then. Um, housing prices have gone through the roof. Um, we had the Occupy Central protests. Um, maybe some of you were out there, I don't know. Um, the, uh, the nativism movement, but I mean, a, as an economist, you know, I would say basically anytime there's inflation, people get unhappy. And it might be about this thing here, and it might be about that thing there, and, and, but, but definitely people will be unhappy. And, and in, in Hong Kong, it, it sort of turned into this. Um, so, so once again, um, addressing this housing um, um, deficit has, has been uh, a key priority for, for the new government. Um, so, as recently as this February, the plan was changed once again, once again. So now, um, the um, prior housing for 86,000 people um, has now increased to 134,000. Um, some, some plots were added and the size of the park was reduced, but also um, building heights were, were increased and um, they, um, have have also I should say um, um, out, outlined this as as part of the part of the reason for changing the plan yet again in um, in February is, is the housing demand and uh, and now there's there's talk of a second central business district in Quintong, which is moving along. Um, so um, so the residential land has has gone up and other areas were slightly scaled back. Um, as a result, um, here here are the the you can see this is the old plan here and no no extra plots and this is the new the new plan here with a few extra plots squeezed in. Um, the um, also the the building heights. This is the old plan and this is this is how high the buildings were going to be before um, versus Lion Rock, our our landmark, and and then now you can see how much the higher the buildings are going to be in the district. So they're still preserving a view of the ridge line, but um, you know, taking into account um, our, our needs of today. Um, the, um, looking to the future, um, I, I think it'll be quite, um, quite a, a fun district to, um, to work in, probably more fun than it is today. Um, the plan is that you know, the first floor or two will all be commercial, so it'll be um, sort of street front shops rather than kind of like a, a big indoor mall. It'll, it'll be more outdoors and, and you can walk along. <clears throat> I, I hope everybody's been able to hear me. I notice I'm kind of going in and out with the, uh, with a microphone here. Um, the, um, the, the, the ground floor will be retail and, and a big, um, drive was to sort of pedestrianize the city again, get away from these sort of big monolithic um, you know, all of the shopping malls in Hong Kong seem the same to me now. It's all the same chain stores, you know, in all the same malls. You know, there's a Uniqlo and a Zara and, uh, you know, in, in, in each one and, and they're all chains. So, so hopefully this will, this will mix it up a bit um, and, and celebrate the waterfront. That's the idea, you know, not to be inside an air-conditioned building, but to, to be able to walk around and see it and enjoy it for what it is. Um, so hopefully um, some, some water sports and, and other activities that can take place in this, uh, in this area. Um, so here's, here's the final view. Um, so my, my, my parting thoughts on this are, um, it, it is a very special site in a very special city um, and, um, and, and the value is, is tremendous. Um, over the 20 years, um, each time to my mind, um, the plan was improved. You know, I, I think it was it was better. Um, the um, the land values um, are helped by by having the cruise terminal. Um, it it was tempting to reclaim, but I'm glad we found other other ways to to find land elsewhere. Um, and um, and it would have been once once you reclaim, it's gone forever. Um, but um, on on the other hand, uh, it it's also interesting how you know, the things that we have wanted have changed over the 20 years from, you know, first we want all housing and then, no, we want parks and we want open space, even though we already have a ton of parks and open space. And then, and then now, and now the clock, the pendulum has, has 
turned back, and now, and now we just want more housing, more housing, more housing. Um, the, the other um, parting thought is, you know, academically, uh, it's been very interesting to sort of chronicle, you know, these changes over the years. I, I had fun researching this, you know, like going, going through um, um, town planning board offices and, you know, finding old manila folders and, you know, blowing off the dust. And, but, but, um, but we lost sort of 20 years. So, so you also have to, you know, measure um, the, uh, the improvements versus, you know, if, if, uh, if it had been developed and properly used uh, 20 years ago. So um, now that I've put everybody to sleep on, uh, on that sort of tangentially related subject to cruise, but very topical for us in Hong Kong. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the cruise um, industry, um, both the, the cruise terminal and, and how we got here, and, um, and, and also quite a bit about the global um, cruise industry development too. Um, so first of all, uh, my company is called Worldwide Cruise Terminals, and, and the name is uh, a little bit deceptive because people ask, okay, so, how many countries in the world do you have cruise terminals? Well, actually, it's just Hong Kong. But it's our, our parent company is is Worldwide Flight Services, and and our parent worldwide company then is in is in many places, five continents, two hundred something airports, um, and that's where both Ryan and I started out. So. Um, the the background for uh, KaiTak is that. Um, the cruise lines, um, building ships, um, ordering many years out, planning further, further out than that, um, told uh, Hong Kong, like they told other cities, um, your old cruise terminal is not going to hack it for the new generation of equipment that we're investing billions of dollars in. So um, can, you, can you do your part and also upgrade the infrastructure? Um, the government wanted to do a build, operate, and transfer tender um, and that didn't work, um, mostly because um, Hong Kong, of course, is very interesting. Here we have all private um, port facilities. Um, this is extremely rare, if not unheard of. Everywhere else in the world, the government, you know, owns and operates um, all, all of the port facilities. Basically, it's it's um, very unusual, and and especially in Hong Kong, that everything is private. Um, and that, and that was the intention. Um, the government wanted to find a developer to, to build it. Um, the government did, though, have a lot of requirements. You know, they wanted um, something iconic. You know, they wanted a massive, iconic building in the center of the harbor. And um, unlike a container terminal, um, a lot of the economic benefits um, from building a container terminal relatively more, I should say, go to the container terminal operator, and he can, he can get a lot of economic benefit from it. Whereas for, for crews, um, a lot of the economic benefits are actually very widespread throughout the community. So, um, so yes, um, you know, the terminal has charges, but then um, the economic benefits spread out to hotels and airlines and, and shops and um, ground handlers, you know, as well as, you know, stevedores, tugs, um, bunkerers, um, you know, there's, there's the whole marine side of it, but then there's the whole tourism aspect too, you know, the shops and, and the tours and, and um, the um, travel agencies now selling packages throughout Hong Kong and getting very, very good commissions, much better than they get on, on airline tickets. Um, so, so because the economic benefit is spread so wide, basically the three um, Hong Kong property developers who bid, and we all know our Hong Kong property developers are very keen financially. They do not do things that lose money. And um, they said, right, we'll build a cruise terminal, but only if we can also build um, a massive grade A office tower and luxury residential and high-end shopping mall, sort of all on adjoining lands. And, and the government said, mm, not what we had in mind. Uh, thank you. We'll do it ourselves. So, so that's what they did. So the government had uh, another tender in 2010 to, um, to, to design and build. And then uh, subsequent to that, another terminal uh, another another tender to manage and operate the terminal and and that's where we came in 
Um, that's where we're where where we were interested and where we where we put in a bid. Um, then um, you know, not so many years ago, 20, 2013, the first ship came in. So um, our company um, is a joint venture, 60% um, by Worldwide Flight Services, and uh, we have local partner, um, sorry, Shuntak for 20%, and Royal Caribbean is also sort of an anchor tenant, if you will, um, a, a big customer and a partner in it, in it 20%. Um, I, I forgot to update this slide. Actually, it turns out the cost for this was 6.6 um, .6 billion. Um, looks up, look. Yeah, and, uh, originally, everybody thought it was 8 billion, but it, it, it turns out that they underspent the budget. It was actually significantly under, under budget. So still the most expensive cruise terminal in the world by far. But, <laughs> but some 20% you know, less than, than we've been thinking uh, this time. So um, what, do we, what do we do there? Um, we are very much like the airport authority. Um, our business, our, our, our income comes from um, marketing um, the terminal to some extent, but mostly Hong Kong to, to cruise lines because really we have to convince them that they want to come to Hong Kong um, and the, the terminal is, is somewhat secondary. I mean, Im important, it needs to be good, but, but um, but the, the market is key. Um, aside from that, then we need to um, do as much as we can to lease out shops there, hold events there, um, get advertising there. Um, that's sort of our income. Um, then operationally, um, we, we manage interactions between all these, all these partners that I list out here. So all the government departments, um, you know, the CIQs and police and Marine Department, um, Port Health and, and those, but then also the commercial entities, the lines, their handlers, um, agents, stevedores, security cleanings, tug pilots, tour operators, coach, um, all, all, the, all the ground transportation um, providers in, in Hong Kong. We, you know, ferries, taxis, minibus, bus, uh, we, we work together with all of them to try to create um, a good experience for the cruise lines and their guests. Um, so. Here's where we are today. Um, now, so I've covered the past. Um, now I'm covering the present. We'll get to the future in a bit. Um, this was taken, I think, last December. Um, two ships at birth. Very happy day. Um, a little bit more about the project. Um, it is the world's biggest um, cruise terminal, um, bigger than a lot of, of airports. This is very low tech. I'm a low tech guy. I hope you don't mind. Um, it's, it's also um, definitely much longer than the ICC building. So, so just, just to give you a perspective of, of how, how much, a, a, how much walking back and forth we do, but also, for example, you know, a lot of things in the, um, in the commissioning stage, like when we found out that all of the um, land ports were, were mislabeled. So you can imagine, you know, walking you know, up and down, you know, the, the whole building, like testing the, the, you know, the sockets one by one to, to get their, their Mac code, um, you know, correct. Um, and then, um, yes, it is, it is big enough for two aircraft carriers. And uh, the remarkable thing is that, you know, we think of aircraft carriers as this, you know, projection of power throughout the world, but, but actually they're a lot smaller than the biggest cruise ships. So, um, not a lot. They're, they're significantly smaller. Um, now a little bit on to the um, to the cruise market. This is this is a fun slide, for me. <laughs> I, oh, hopefully everybody agrees. Um, this is um, these these bars show um, orders of cruise ships. Um, not not when they're delivered, but when they're ordered. So um, so we can see during the global financial crisis, 2008 2009, um, the cruise lines sort of you know, stopped and waited and, and stopped ordering. But then you can see, you can see now, you know, now they're ordering like there's no tomorrow. Um, and, and the result, you know, as, as, of, as of now, there's really only two yards or two companies that, that make the very big cruise ships. So, um, 
they, they kind of have a lock on the market. Um, even if the cruise lines want to order more and get them today, they can't. You know, now deliveries go out you know, many years from now. That's, that's the result. And they just have to wait until, until the yards have a slot and can build. Small ones are still OK. If you want to build a 300-passenger cruise ship, no problem. Many yards can do it. But the big one is now just two companies. Um, you know, there were four companies maybe five years ago, and they've sort of merged and, and combined. And, and now it's uh, kind of like Airbus and Boeing, <laughs> for, the, for that matter, um, except they're all in Europe. Um, for now, for now, China's working on one. Um, then, um, just looking at the at the growth of the cruise industry, um, it's been a pretty steady five percent year over year, every year globally. Um, and and the res the constraint now is really just the ability to build ships. Um, they they they're just not building them any faster than that. So, um, so this is. You know, one of the reasons why um, cruising hasn't seen as many big booms and busts is because there there haven't been, you know, huge supply surges. Um, now, that's the global rate, but but how have we done in in Asia as relative to this? We can see, okay, in 2013, Asia was 3.4 percent of deployed cruise capacity. Um, by 2014, okay, now we were up to 4.4%. Um, still tiny. Um, so these are all from different presentations. So sorry that they're not, um, they don't, they're not formatted the same. By 2015, okay, you know, now we're, you know, 6% of the global market. 2016, 9.2%. Um, 2017, 10.9%. So, so Asia has has you know more than doubled basically in, in this in this period. Um, now, here's here's a, a sort of better um, comparison of growth, um, and I'll, I'll point out two numbers. I guess one is um, the number of cruises um, in Asia between 2013 and 2016. The, the compound uh, annual growth rate was 22%. Um, passenger capacity between 2013 and 2016 went up 29%. Um, so you can see it's been, it's been growing um, at, a, at a strong double-digit rate. Again, globally it's smaller, but starting from a smaller base, we've been growing much faster. Um, so, so how are we doing in Hong Kong, you ask? I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Here's, here's the answer. Um, at, at Kai Tak, and again, you know, there's another cruise terminal, of course, ocean terminal. But, um, but at Kai Tak, um, I'm, I'm happy to say that for um, a, a similar um, period, um, the number of ship calls has seen a growth rate of 62%. Um, and, well, passengers and, and ship calls. And number of ship days uh, has grown at 45%. So, so um, again, this is just Kai Tak, but you can see that that you know we're we're almost it it almost looks like we're doubling up year year over year, and now Kai Tak is about 75 percent of the market, or we we do about three times as many passengers as the rest of the facilities in Hong Kong combined, um, which is good. We we. You know, we we were taking a lot of lumps in the in the early years, but now, uh, yeah, we we've sort of proved our ourselves since then. That said, things do not always go in a straight line every single year. We wish they did. Um, so next year, it looks like um, the lines kind of maybe over um, put too much capacity in, into uh, into China because they all knew that they wanted to be there and they wanted to grab a piece of the market but they sort of flooded it with capacity prices fell not getting a good return on their assets you know moving some ships elsewhere but but we see it will grow again after that um, just to um, tell you a little bit about what the market is in in Hong Kong um, we're, we're quite different from the other Chinese ports. The other Chinese ports, you know, about 95% of the people going through the ports are Chinese people going on a local cruise in, in Asia. And um, in, in Hong Kong, um, we have a much more, I think, 
stable and, and robust um, profile of uh, passengers. And, and this is all of Hong Kong. This isn't, this isn't just Kai Tak now. But, um, but you can see um, that, we're, that we're more like a third each, like a third Hong Kong people taking cruises, a third PRC people taking cruises, and a third um, visitors from, from overseas, mostly from far overseas. Um, um, Australia is now our biggest uh, long haul source market, followed by the United States, followed by the UK. So, um, so we're, we're quite strong in, in a number of different markets. Um, this year, however, we'll see that um, the number of local Hong Kong people taking cruises is, is kind of exploding. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see how 2017 turns out, but I, I think the, these two numbers, the bar chart on the left is, is how we count in Hong Kong. And then, and then these figures on, on the right are how, um, how the Cruise Line Industry Association counts. So on the right, these figures, this 110,000 is people from Hong Kong who take a cruise anywhere in, 20, in 2016. So it could be somebody from Hong Kong, you know, flies to the Mediterranean and takes a cruise, is, is in here. Whereas, whereas the, the 2016 that we measure um, locally from the Immigration Department, this is just Hong Kong people taking a cruise from Hong Kong. But, um, but in any case, I think you, you will see a big jump in, in Hong Kong's um, um, position in the, in the Asian cruise ranking um, this next year. Um, so who, who are we getting at the Kai Tak Cruise Terminal? Um, again, I think in, in the beginning, a lot of the naysayers said, oh, it's you know, only going to be the ships that can't fit in at Ocean Terminal. But we've, we've proved them wrong. And, and a number of um, large and small ship lines um, all um, prefer to use Kai Tak, particularly for turn calls. Um, the, the other thing that's happened as a result of um, the cruise terminal opening and um, a, a fair amount of selling on, on our parts as well is that um, the, um, the major cruise lines have now all set up offices in, in Hong Kong. So Genting, of course, has been here forever. Um, Costa opened an office in, in 2006, but then the rest of Carnival followed in 2013, Royal Caribbean the next year, Norwegian the year after that. So now, um, now we're just waiting for MSC. So we'll, <laughs> I'll, leave that, I'll leave that to the next speaker. Um, um, here, here are some of the, um, the awards that we've won. Um, a, few, a few global sort of management awards, um, a number of local environmental awards and, and uh, CSR awards. Um, it's a, for a cruise terminal, it's very busy. And I, th I think... Um, you know, the, the press will sort of wander through on a day when there's no ship there, and they, and they say, gee, it's so empty. And, and it is, but um, I guess what I tell people is um, a cruise ship terminal um, is, is definitely not like an airport, and, and it's designed kind of like a storm drain. And most of the time, when you look at a storm drain, it's this, it's this huge concrete pipe and there's a little trickle of water going down, going down the bottom. But then when it rains, guess what? The entire pipe is, is full with water and you really need every inch of space or, or every, 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 every bit of, of capacity in that pipe that you have. And, and trust me, um, if, if you come to our terminal when there's, when there's a mega cruise ship at birth, all of that space is, is fully packed and, and utilized. But um, but aside from that, um, you know, we, we do have ships on average every other day this year, slightly, slightly more. Um, but um, but we, we also use it for many things. Overseas, a lot of cruise terminals, when there's no ship there, they, you know, they, they lock the door and, and close it and, and nothing happens. You know, all the lights go out. Um, for us, we're open 365 days a year. Um, we have restaurants. We have a lot of big... Uh, events and filming. You know, we have some 20 banquets a month. Um, we have all these visitors to um, to our rooftop garden. Um, so, so here um, here's a little advertisement for our uh, for our <laughs> dim sum facility. If anybody wants to come, so this is where all the weddings get held and seats about you know 900 people. Um, here's our our ta tan tang, uh, which is the food is good. Here's the Western restaurant. Um, 
some other, I, I'll, I'll sort of, here, here's a, a sampling of some of the events. You know, we have a lot of sort of branded events, you know, car launches, fashion shows, um, but, you know, also a ton of fun runs and, and uh, we'll, we'll just, we'll, last year and, and this year, we have lots of repeat customers. You know, I think um, Audemars Piguet has been there three times, Mercedes-Benz twice, um, Tesla has been there twice, Elon Musk came and, and talked. Um, um, like again, here's, here's, some, uh, here's some pictures from some of these past events. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm five minutes over. So anyway, I, I wasn't gonna talk to these very much, but um, Justin Bieber did a concert at Kai Tak. I'm sorry if you missed it. I was there. I was sorry I was there, but I, <laughs> not, not, <laughs> it's, but, but you know, still, still kind of cool. Cindy Crawford, I was a little bit more excited for her. Tattoo convention, uh, both last year and again, a couple weekends ago. Um, here's, here's where we wanna be. Um, I guess what um, probably I spend, you know, a third of my time lobbying various government departments to kind of deliver on um, what the promise was when when we when we bid the project back in back in 2011. Um, so um, we'd like them to build the roads um, that haven't haven't been built. Um, you know, open the the MTR station. Um, I, I fully understand why the MTR station was delayed, um, you know, to excavate the Song Dynasty relics. Fully support. Uh, I was a, an amateur archaeologist at one point, so I, I fully support. But we really want that MTR station. <laughs> then uh, the tender off the adjacent hotel plots um, and also build up some um, tourism facility. Um, we, we also are going to um, really leverage off the, um, some of these massive infrastructure projects. Um, the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge um, will do two things. One, it will allow people from the western bank of the Pearl River to come to our cruise terminal to take a cruise in about two hours, where it used to take more than four before. And, and that's a, a pretty big difference if you have to get up early in the morning and, um, and go through immigration and so on and so forth. That, that'll be uh, much better. Um, the high-speed rail um, is another huge one. And then the, um, this one isn't in the press at all, so maybe you haven't heard of it, but there's gonna be a new border crossing. So, um, so here's, here's where the bridge is for, for those of you who don't know it. Um, aside from connecting us to more source markets, um, Macau is a very popular destination for people passing through Hong Kong on a cruise, um, but it's very hard to get there and back in the space of a day if they, only, if they only have a day, because you have to go literally cruise ship to coach to the ferry terminal, to ferry, to coach around Macau, to ferry back to Hong Kong, to coach, to, to the cruise ship. So to, to be able to go just, you know, ship to coach to ship, um, granted, still with some immigration in, in between will be, will be much better. Um, and it, it'll be another selling point for, for Hong Kong. Um, the other one is um, the high-speed rail. And I hope, I hope everybody supports the co-located checkpoint because it is so important to, uh, to uh, making it work functionally. But, but the, um, that will allow people, about 270 million people in the southern part of China to get to Hong Kong with a four-hour train ride. So, so the, our addressable source market has gone from being, you know, maybe um, a, a mere hundred million in, in Guang, Guangdong province to 270 million. You know, this is almost like North America, you know, within a four-hour train ride of our port, you know. So, so this is potentially huge if we can, if we can leverage off it. Um, the, um, the final one, and, and again, this is not sexy, it's never in the news, is, is that um, they're putting in a new, proper, um, modern border checkpoint at, at the east side of our crossing with, with Shenzhen. Because now um, everybody tries to go to a western border crossing because, again, immigration is co-located, you know, both uh, immigration officers at one desk, essentially. And, and the other ones, 
you know, are, are some distance apart. You know, the, uh, the former British check post is on this side of the river and the Chinese check post is on the other side of the river and you have to get on and off the coach twice. This will be another co-located one and we can see people from all up and down the, the east coast of, uh, of Guangdong um, making use of this and, and coming to uh, our terminal quite, quite easily rather than trying to navigate through downtown Shenzhen, you know, where, where traffic, you know, is, is a nightmare, you know, former fishing village, now city of 12 million. Um, so with this, I, I would like to uh, show off our first, um, if I can, maybe I can't, our first five ship call day. All right, I'm trying all the buttons. <laughs> Maybe I have to, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, okay, here we go. It was, it was raining cats and dogs all day. Like, like any historic event, of, it's not complete without a huge rainstorm. to our next speakers, MSC. And that's it. Thank you very much.